Okay, welcome everybody. Let's just do a quick sound check here as always. Looks good. Chat's up and running, that was quick. So maybe my internet's better this week than, than it was last week. Let's just mute YouTube before we get started. Come on, internet. I don't know why it's always so slow. All right. Well, I can see the questions anyway, so even if this doesn't stop. All right, well, I can do that later. So welcome, everybody, to episode 42 of the Volatility Barometer. Thank you for coming. I think we've got a good one today. I think it's an interesting subject that does actually come up quite a bit. Not in this exact form, but I think it's time that we actually break this down and answer the question once and for all, is there ever a reason to close trades during the day session and, or yeah, ignore the nighttime session basically, because as we know, a lot of the nighttime session can be a little bit scary. A lot of the bad things happen in the market. So, you know, it might actually be better for traders to just try to focus on the day session if possible. So we are going to get to that, but I'm going to unpack a pretty long I don't know, 15 minute presentation. I don't just like to answer the question in one minute. You know, I like to break it down in more detail. So let me mute this. Where is this person speaking? Yeah, so I'm gonna go into it and uh, there's gonna be a lot of things along the way that I think, you know, traders can learn, little nuggets of information here and there. So let me do a quick introduction and then we'll get right into the presentation. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I really do appreciate the support. So my name's Brent Osachoff, I'm a Canadian, and I'm a former professional golfer, so you will hear the odd golf analogy slipped in there from time to time. I run, I love movies, diehard UFC fan, and I do love to travel, so you'll see this background change throughout the year. So just give me one minute here to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you do feel like you need a little more structure in your investing, I do also manage a private investing community with members from over 65 countries around the world. And it's all centered around both of our diversified portfolios. You can choose the one that best suits your personal level of risk tolerance. There's a daily email sent out every morning with a ton of very useful volatility metrics at the top, which you can learn more about each one of them and start applying them to your own trading. There's a daily article or video where I break down some of the most requested topics from members. And then most importantly, of course, in every email, every day, I state exactly what position each of my strategies will be in, along with all the allocation sizing and risk management that goes with them. I've made it easy to follow so you can get the same consistent performance the VTS community has enjoyed for over nine years now. No obligation, but if this is something you may be interested in, go to volatilitytradingstrategies.com, click the subscribe tab, and the monthly subscription does come with a free two-week trial so you can check it all out before committing. Thanks again for supporting the YouTube channel and spending a little bit of time with me here today. So let's get on with the show. Okay, so like I said, we've got a presentation here, but I'm also going to dedicate a lot of time today to the Q&A section. I asked for a bunch of questions, so people submitted. I think there's nine or ten in there. We'll get to those. And then, of course, in the chat. So if you do have questions, and it can be on any topic, it doesn't necessarily have to be on what I'm talking about here. It can be any subject. Just highlight with some type of emojis or put a cue or a question so I can just pick it out a little easier in the chat. And uh, lastly, of course, as always, hit the thumbs up button. It only takes a second, but it really does help me out an awful lot on YouTube. You know, they like the, the thumbs up. I, I don't know what to say. The algorithm likes it. So do that favor for me and let's get right into this presentation. So this all started. And I get this question a lot. Like I said, this is actually a pretty common subject, but uh, first of all, just always double, triple check to see I'm on a live or a screen share. Okay, we're good to go. So I get this question all the time in some form, but last week, our friend Lucas here asked, he just read my article number 633 about shorting volatility. In order to avoid overnight gaps on the SVXY, have you ever considered only being short while the market is open? What he means, buy SVXY on market opening and sell before closing, basically day trading every single day that the signal is active. What are your thoughts? So in general, again, like I said, I could very likely give you a 30 second answer here. 
but I don't think that's going to be very useful to actually learn from. But that's what we're going to be unpacking, this idea that, as I alluded to, of course, as volatility traders and even equity traders, I'm sure you've experienced it many, many times, and you will in the future many, many times, where everything's fine, you go to sleep, you wake up the next morning, maybe check the futures. That's the first thing I do in the morning, and as soon as I wake up, I check the Bloomberg, and sometimes you open it up and it's, you, you know already, you get that sinking feeling, wow, this is gonna be a terrible day. I know what positions I'm in and I know they're not going to react very well to what's, what, what you're seeing in the morning. So we do get those overnight gut kicks from time to time. And so it's actually pretty natural to ask this question. Now with respect to a volatility trader, it is especially important because what we're looking at here is the largest VXX spikes. VXX is just a one times long volatility product. But you can see the largest spikes here, I mean 37% being the largest one, and there's many, many double digit spikes. I mean the top 30, and this is only going back basically not very long. You can see most of these dates are actually quite recent within the last three to four years is pretty heavy in the big spike range. So it's natural to assume that, hey, well, why don't we just save ourselves the headache and just trade that day session? So the first thing that I'm going to do, I know this isn't specifically your question, but I think it's important to break it down, first of all, with respect to the S&P 500. So we've got S&P 500 data here going back to 1993, open, high, low, close. This is all we really need to do this simple test. So what I'm doing essentially is buy and hold on the SPY, and then we're also doing open to close. This would be just the daytime session, right? So that would be for this cell, if you wanted to do this yourself, you would just take the close minus the open, and you can see the return during the day session. And then of course, the close to open session is the opposite. It would be essentially the previous day's close to today's open. You're holding the overnight session, and then you do this close to this open, and you can actually just get the rate of return of both of those. So before I actually do a little spoiler, in case some of you haven't actually seen this data before, just leave in the comments if you've got uh, a guess, but what do you think it's gonna look like? I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but it's actually fairly jarring when you see it at first, and your brain's probably gonna think, oh wow, there's massive arbitrage opportunities here. I can't believe it. All of us traders should be doing you know, X based on that. So let's see what it actually looks like. This is the data going back to 1993. So you can see what's happening here. This open to close, the daytime session, is actually negative. That's the blue line here. Since 1993, during the daytime session, the S&P 500 hasn't actually made any profit. All of the profit, and then some, is happening close to open. This is the nighttime session. That's the red line there. And then the black line, is the S&P 500 buy and hold. So you can see buy and hold since 1993, it's 7.5% annualized, pretty massive drawdown as we know. That one happened in the financial crisis right there in 2008. But actually all the action is happening in the nighttime session. So initially, like I said, I could probably just stop here. I'm not going to, so stick with me, hang in there. Lots more to learn when we apply this to volatility. But we could essentially say that, you know, all of the action in the S&P 500 is happening in the overnight session. So if you're going to try to do a daytime only trading strategy, you're not going to have a whole lot to work with there. Now, I know your question wasn't specific to the SPY. Your question was volatility. We can move to that. But there is one interesting thing that I will point out. It doesn't change the conclusion. It just adds a little bit of recency to it. You can notice that this acceleration way back before the dot-com bust probably did have a pretty significant influence. So what I did as well, just to be sure, I checked from October 4th, 2011. You'll know why I chose that date in a second, but it's about 10 years. You can see in the last 10 years, the close to open, wait a second, open to close. I've labeled these wrong. Sorry about that. Ah, I hate when I do stuff on live streams like that. Um, this is, let me just, yeah, the, the, the daytime session, these are backwards. The daytime sessions should be the one that says 7.84. Anyway, that's in line with where it should be normally, about the same. 
but the nighttime session did slightly improve to the point where you can kind of say that you can see it's not great, but it is a little bit positive. So there's about three to 4% there anyway. But overall, this thing still stands that most of the action in the S&P 500 is happening during the day session. So you wouldn't want to, or sorry, the night session. What am I thinking? I'm getting all confused here. That's probably my fault. I could have found an easier way to label this. But anyway, the night session, the red lines. So now I'll tell you why we chose October 2011, because here we've got the UVXY data. Now I'm going to use UVXY data simply because your question was SVXY, but SVXY is a 0.5 times product and it really doesn't move very much. So if you're trying to build a strategy that A, doesn't have a whole lot of action during the day session and B, you're applying it to a 0.5 leverage, you're really gonna have nothing to work with. So what I actually did instead is I'm gonna go ahead and use the UVXY, which is a 1.5 times leveraged product. This chart you see, this is just coming straight from our volatility dashboard, one of several dashboards that I post every day for the VTS community. Side note, shameless plug, if you do wanna join the community, there is a free trial. I'll put one down in the description. It's also on my website. And you know you can see everything for two weeks, the dashboard, the, the live trades, cancel anytime, no obligation, all that stuff applies. If you happen to forget to cancel your free trial, don't worry, I do give Refunds, no questions asked. But anyway, you can see the volatility landscape. You asked about a 0.5, but there are also other choices. I picked the UVXY simply so we could actually see the difference a little bit more pronounced in the data. So same thing, UVXY buy and hold, and then I've got open to close, which would be the daytime session, and then we've got close to open. Now, what do we know about volatility ETPs, especially long volatility ETPs? they essentially go to zero. So we can't actually learn anything from this chart. You can see down 100%, down 99.97. This says 100, it's not actually 100. If I add a few decimals, it's probably, there you go. Three nines. So down 999, basically they're going to zero. We can't learn anything there. So I basically flipped it and had a short UVXY, and this is where some of the profit can come in. So we've got buy and hold, and then we've got open to close and close to open. Now this is where it gets a little bit more interesting because now there actually isn't that big of a difference here. Remember the S&P 500, huge difference, massive difference. And even if you factor in the last 10 years, still a significant difference. But it starts to close a little bit when you're talking about volatility. Now, I know probably some of you in the comment section understand why this is because volatility ETPs themselves have two factors that cause their movements, not just one. Of course, the S&P 500, price only, just buyers and sellers, it's an open market. Volatility ETPs also have that contango factor because the, the ETFs themselves are tracking a methodology based on those underlying VIX futures. And when you've got those VIX futures that are in contango about 84% of the time, I've actually got a chart for that too, if you want to see it, where M1, M2 VIX futures, which all of those front month volatility ETPs that I showed, all of these are based on just the front two months, 84% of the time they are in contango. Upward sloping VIX futures term structure, basically like this. These front two are in contango right now. The rest of the term structure is a mess, but the front two are in contango. So we've got a situation where you've got eight hours during the day session and it is being affected by that contango. So it's not overly surprising that we are gonna see this gap close a little bit. Now, when we talk about the actual data, annual growth of 5.66, buy and hold short UVXY with a drawdown of 92%, obviously no thank you. No rational investor could ever actually do that. And then you've got the close to open, which just like the S&P 500, the nighttime session is better. You might think, oh wow, we're gonna be ignoring all of those big spikes. Basically all of them or most of them happened in the overnight session. But that's not actually what we see in the data. Data-wise, the night session is better. However, because of the contango effect, there is a little bit there on the daytime session. Still not enough to trade. Nobody would ever be tempted to ever do a strategy like this. So let's move on. Let's do something that's even a little more interesting. 
to what we've got here, this is a basic short volatility strategy that I designed. So this is just based on what you'll probably see a lot of people on Twitter talk about, how if the VIX futures are in contango, you would short volatility. If they're in backwardation, basically M1, M2 less than zero, you would either be in cash or perhaps you'd even go long vol. Today, long vol isn't part of the equation, so I'm basically just going to cash. Now, just a quick side note, just so people can learn a little something while we're going here. Remember, you don't really care about just the M1, M2 relationship. That is always going to be skewed by the fact that volatility ETPs hold differing amounts of the VIX futures based on how many days to expiration they have. So you can see the front month has 18 days left. When this gets to about three or two or one day left, the contango magnitude is going to be wildly skewed. So what you actually have to do is you have to adjust all of these. You have to do just basically like little, you know, simple calculations to adjust everything so that you can get an adjusted M1, M2. This is a smooth contango measurement that takes into account the number of days to expiration. So when it ticks over from one day to zero days to the next cycle, starting with maybe 27 days, it's a completely smooth transition and it doesn't have those massive steps that just a standard M1, M2 would. So you always want to make sure you're adjusting for the contango level. But this basic strategy is just contango, adjusted contango over zero, we're short UVXY, otherwise we're gonna be in cash. And this is what that strategy looks like. So it is, I would say significantly better than just buy and hold the UVXY, right? If you do apply that entry level contango metric to the equation, now we're up to a 22.7% annual rate of return. Obviously an alarming drawdown that is part of the short vol trade. Your job as a short vol trader is essentially, you can't eliminate the risk, right? There is no reward without risk and you're always going to be taking on risk. Our job as volatility traders is to try to get that risk down to a level where you, and in my case, since I'm managing a portfolio for a lot of people, the, the average investor can actually sustain and stay the course, right? You got to get that down to the 30s, 20s would be great, but certainly something in the 30s. When you're talking about a drawdown of, I mean, obviously 93 is absurd. Nobody is going to do this. Like, don't go out there and think, wow, I can go make a 22% rate of return. All I have to do is short vol when it's in contango. Sure, but you're definitely going to pull the plug at some point along the way. That does great during normal times, but then... China hard landing here, down 79%. That's ugly. Here's Volpocalypse, big down move there. And then, of course, Q4 2018. COVID, it went down even further, recovers a little. And then, of course, 2022 is an utter disaster. So you're talking about a total non-starter here. But again, we're not actually looking for a buy and hold strategy. What we're trying to determine is the difference between open, close, and close to open. So kind of getting to the punchline here. Here is the short UVXY strategy based on adjusted M1, M2 contango. Positive, we're in it. Otherwise, we're in cash. Open to close is the daytime session. So this is what those results look like. Open to close in red, daytime session. You're talking about a return of 4.3. Again, disastrous drawdown. You didn't improve that at all. But all you really did was now you're missing out on all the good stuff because like it or not, of course, the big moves do happen overnight, and that works both ways. So yes, sometimes you get whipsawed overnight, sometimes you get gut kicked, but other times you get massive gap ups, and you need that. You need a strategy to be based on something tradable. You can't just eliminate all risk, then there's no reward, and you're, why not just trade you know, short-term treasuries or you know, fixed income or something like that. So we're vol traders. You have to actually go where the volatility is, which is actually the overnight session. But we're not done here because this isn't actually a totally complete picture. Unfortunately, we don't actually have intraday uh, contango data for the VIX futures. So this is a somewhat skewed number. This is essentially contango from the night before applying to the morning of the trade. So this is not a complete picture. I actually do have probably 60% or so of the intraday volatility data going back to 2011. So I have a test that I'm gonna show you in a minute. So let's just put a pin on this. It does get better, not a whole lot better, but it does get better. 
I don't know if you can hear that. I'm in Dubai. You just you hear crazy cars, Ferraris, Bugattis going by every day. It's uh, it's pretty loud, and it's annoying. How come they get to drive Ferraris and I don't? But anyway, we are moving on to close to open. So now this is where all the action is. This is the overnight session using our basic strategy, and here's the results here. So we've got buy and hold, disastrous drawdown, and we've got close to open overnight session improved a little bit. 70% is way beyond any rational investor's risk tolerance. So again, don't rush out and do this. But you can see that it's actually the nighttime session where the opportunity lies. Doesn't mean you're going to win. You can always take something good and ruin it. So obviously be careful and don't do this simple strategy. But you can see actually it is improved in the night session. Now, this is what I said, the incomplete data. I actually do have intraday VIX data for, I don't know, 50, 60% of the time. So if I apply my incomplete data to the VIX futures and try to get the contango at market open is the signal for going long at market open, you know, as close as possible to that time, you can see it does actually get better. It goes up to 13. And what I would say is if I had perfect data for opening you know, futures, it would probably be 14 to be honest. But the drawdown is, of course, totally unmanageable. That would probably go up to about 92, 93, and it would be disastrous as well. But even with this incomplete or no data, we can see that the daytime session is not worth trading. There just isn't enough there. So the last thing that I wanted to show, if you were a person who is still not quite convinced that this S&P 500 daytime day trading the SPY and leaving the night out, you have to remember that we're in a little bit of an anomaly now where trade fees are almost free or free in many cases. But you have to understand that that's a very short window of time. We actually used to pay quite a bit of money for trade fees. So I'm going to add that in. But another side note with trade fees, just because your broker has free commissions, don't assume that you're not paying for something. A lot of people think, oh, wow, the banks are so nice to us. They gave us free trade fees. They didn't. There's plenty of other places that they can scout money from us. You know, maybe the bid-ask spreads are, are, are not as attractive. You're not getting good fill prices. They're charging you for data bundles now that they never used to charge for. You know, you used to get everything when you signed up. Now, if you want volatility data, you have to pay for that. If you want certain futures data, you've got to pay for that. There's always additional bundles and, you know, that's not free. And then always, of course, assume that they're selling your data and making money on the side as well. So, you know, free commissions is not free commissions. But if you're curious about what the actual penalty, there was a time, not actually that long ago, where Thinkorswim, TD Ameritrade, was charging $9.99 per trade. So the first thing we'll look at is what were to happen if you were now day trading and you were adding in these fees, $9.99. It's actually quite punishing. You can see what happens. This person who's thinking they've got this great close to open strategy, a nighttime session, well, you're actually negative, right? If you add in $10 of trade fees on a $25,000 account, this person grew their account to $245,000 over the last, what is that, uh, 20, 29 years. This person turned their 25 into 15. So obviously not great. What if you went to a broker that's slightly better? You went to, say, old school interactive brokers before the last two years. Well, you're still talking about a loss of about 3%, 2.5% here. Again, commissions themselves, they may not sound like much, but it can actually be punishing. Of course, if you have zero commissions, then you will get your $7.99. But again, don't assume it's zero. There is a way that they're going to close this gap on you somehow. These, these brokers, they're not, uh, they're not being generous to us. Let's hit a few conclusions here. First of all, the overnight session has a lot more action than during the market hours. So that was basically the punchline of this is your question was asking, should you avoid the nighttime and only trade the day? I would submit it's actually, if anything, the other way around. You should actually avoid the day because nothing's really happening during the day and you should target the nighttime session. Now, that I'm not suggesting that people actually start day trading this. That's actually pretty silly. 
Number two, added complication of a daily trade rather than zero to three trades per month. This might not affect you if you're the type of person who sits in front of your computer all day long, but believe me, there's a lot of investors out there who really don't want to take 21 trades per strategy. They would much rather just, you know, they want to be tactical because of course buy and hold sucks, but they also know that they're busy, they have families and hobbies and kids and jobs and all these things. You don't want to be parked in front of your computer. So um, that's asking an awful lot for people to be taking on the basically the task of day trading a strategy when the strategy itself is probably not worth it. I'll go wherever the money is. If day trading made me 30% in a specific strategy, well, it is what it is. You get 21 trades a month. But like I've shown, it's probably actually not going to be that great. Trade fees, of course, this is zero, but don't assume that'll last forever and also assume that they're going to scalp something from you. So it's never, it's never free. Number four, the unknown aspect of whether the day versus night discrepancy persists. This one is important because even though this is not called seasonality, you could lump this in with all those other seasonality tests where sometimes people, you know, they'll post them on Twitter. They'll say, well, sell in May and go away, right? They're basically saying that the stock market performance from October to May is better than June to October. So sell in May, come back in October, November and buy the stock market. The problem there is that if you just have a long series of data points, there's always going to be a low, there's going to be a high, there's going to be an average. It's all random and there's going to be outliers. So it just so happens that sometimes these seasonality things show up, but it doesn't mean there's any causation there. Like the sell and man go away, for example. The stock market didn't crash in October 1987 because it was October. It crashed for a very specific reason. The Lehman Brothers didn't collapse in September because it was September. It just happened to happen in September, right? The, all of these other things, they just sort of, they happen when they happen. There's no seasonality there. But when you add it all up, if they fall in certain ranges just by happenstance, you could end up with a seasonality that looks strong when on examination, you wouldn't actually want to put money towards that. So it's the same thing with, you know, people will say quadruple witching hour. Oh, be careful of the S&P 500 because it, it usually does this. Or be careful of the VIX because this specific month is usually more volatile than the rest. None of these things matter. They're just, as a trader, you, you have to just ignore them. You have to just chalk it up to the randomness of markets. And there's always going to be a high and a low in any data set. It doesn't mean there's causation there. And the last thing, even if it does persist, there are dozens of stronger places to find your edge. And I think above all else, I think this is my main point, that even if I were to grant you that you could figure out a way to improve those results and make a decent rate of return, I would still say that there's dozens of better places to allocate your capital. So even if you can cut through all the seasonality and apply your edge and get your volatility metrics going in there and you can, you can turn that basic garbage into something decent, trust me, there's far, far better ways to make money. So that is a very, very long way of saying, no, don't do that. Uh, the original question, like I said, I could have probably answered it in a minute, but you know that's not my style. I like to present the, all of the data and I actually go through it. I'm one of these people that I will examine it to death and I will actually give a real conclusion. If I actually figured something out and I went through all of this data, you know, I might have actually surprised myself. I might have thought, oh, wow, look at that. That data is really interesting. Maybe I should adjust my thinking. You know, that's kind of how I always go about my trading. I never, I'll never just take somebody's word for anything. They'll say something, they'll say, oh, you know, maybe you should just trade the night session or the day session. So, okay, interesting. I'll put it on my list and I'm going to go test it to death to make sure that that's actually correct. And in this case, I wasn't overly surprised by the results. I've known for quite some time that it's, it's just one of those things. There's no reason it's happening. There's no reason to expect it to continue happening. And there's certainly better places to put my money. So I don't worry about seasonality. So that answers your question. All right, let's get into the open Q&A. Starting at the very top, I saw one where he said he wouldn't probably make the live stream, but had a question. So if one were to write an algo to sell in the morning and buy at night, 
sell in the morning and buy at night, so you're trading the overnight session, would it be worth it long run instead of compound buy and hold S&P? I think I just answered all of that. So come back. I, answer, I answered that specifically. So um, no. You could do it. And if commissions were free, like you said, maybe you'll get your 8%. But no, I mean, why would you do that? We're, we're trying to do a whole lot better than the buy and hold on the S&P. All right. New to the community. Thank you very much. My question is regarding the butterfly trade. It's a great tool. Why not doing another short-term one for July 8th? Are you expecting additional risk with a large flush down on the VIX? That's a good question. I think I mentioned that in a recent email, so I don't know how new you are. Maybe you're super new. But um, if you're wondering, we've got this butterfly trade. It's expiring today, so I will, um, at some point today, I will close this. I, I might as well just close it right now just to show everybody how trades are closed. It's actually pretty easy. But the reason that we only have one, I actually have room for two of these, and I'll even allow myself to do three or four of them if the market conditions are right. But why didn't we do another one? Essentially, I'm just waiting for the price to go down a little bit. And this is good enough. Right now, it's Friday. Let's assume the price closes around 1432 or whatever it is now, 1430. If next Monday is a holiday, if on Tuesday we are still facing the same thing where the price is about here, I will absolutely be starting a new one. I don't know which cycle. I might actually focus on the 15th of July because the 8th would be too quick. But yes, definitely expect another one. So why don't I just close this um, UVXY. I'm just going to close this butterfly. Mid 69, natural 64. I always try to get better and I will just enter it. Wait, I don't know five, 10 seconds. I can already see here, I'm not gonna get it. I'm gonna drop this down to 68. Let's see if I can get that. And there you go, trade closed. So profitable month, good for the vol trend strategy. And yes, to answer your question, we will absolutely be entering new ones uh, pretty soon. Like I said, very likely Tuesday. And if the price on Tuesday even goes down, I might even open two, maybe not on the same day, but you know, back to back Tuesday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday, one of them would be for the 15th. And then maybe, you know, I could extend the other one out to the 22nd or, you know, there, there's no reason why you can't layer several of those. The UVXY broken wing butterflies is as if you're a member of the community, you know how much I like that trade. Just structurally, it's a short vol strategy with no upside risk. I mean, what's not to love about that? So. If anybody's actually curious on what we're talking about, this is sort of an, an inside thing with BTS, I guess. But what you could do is you could go to, where could you go? Why don't I send you to the website instead of the YouTube channel? Today, we'll send you to the website. Just go on portfolio on uh, volatilitytradingstrategies.com and you can actually just see the strategies. Watch this video that says vol trend strategy. And you can see it's about UVXY broken wing butterflies. It's one of my very favorite ways to short volatility because there's really no upside risk or there's you know maybe a 1% upside risk. So it's absolutely one of my top, top strategies. It's been doing very well since last October or something. Um, it's made a great rate of return. I don't know exactly how much, but it's doing pretty well. Given that the market is getting devastated, to have anything that's positive is actually pretty good, but it's doing well. So... Uh, yeah, I invite everybody to check it out. No pressure. Broken wing butterfly. Okay, let's do a few more of these and then jump into the community tab. All right, I'm currently holding a 10% short Q's position from earlier this year. Hopefully you made some money. Hopefully it was very early, early this year and you made a lot of money on that trade. Good for you. I feel we have more downside. However, I'm debating on closing half or doing a hedge, possibly butterfly. Is there a question there or just a comment? I suppose indirectly you're asking me what I think about that. I don't give direct trade advice ever. I don't know you, I don't know your risk tolerance, and I don't know what your portfolio looks like. So I could never give you any trading advice. But yeah, I would say good luck with that. Hedging, I'm not a fan of. If you've been following my work, you, you will know I don't hedge. Hedging is very expensive. I prefer getting my safety through diversification, multiple strategies, different directional bias for all of them, proper allocation sizing, conservative position sizing, and 
you know, hedging is just a, it's like, you know, you're on a boat, you just throw a big heavy anchor out the back of the boat. You, it's pretty tough to keep moving forward when you've got that hedge. Either your trade does well and your hedge does poorly, or your hedge does well and your main trade does poorly. I just, I just don't like that. So um, I've, over the last, you know, 17 years of my career, I have found clever ways so that I don't actually have to hedge. And I can make a much higher rate of return. Not telling you not to hedge though. So again, I can't, I can't answer this. Maybe it was more just a comment. How about holding long UVXY, January, 2024, in the money calls for hedging in case of high volatility spikes. So the, this probably sounds like a good idea because you're not going to have to keep re-upping your hedges every single month and burning that short-term capital. But remember, there's always a flip side to everything. And if the longer you do these calls, as you're saying, to hedge your portfolio, you're getting very little convexity out of that trade. And even if the volatility does spike up, that hedge is not going to move very fast at all. I mean, it's a two-year leap option. It's it's barely going to move. So you're, you're not going to get that full bang for your buck that hedging gives people. So I'm sure that a lot of people have done studies about, you know, the, the ideal duration of your hedges and how much hedging you should do. Again, getting back to the original thing, I just think there are ways to structure a portfolio, especially using clever option strategies where you will not find the need to hedge your portfolio. And uh, you can just forget throwing that anchor out the back of the boat and just keep sailing forward. I think that's the goal for everybody. But yeah, long-term hedges, the longer you go, the less convexity you're gonna get. And you're gonna get this massive volatility spike and you're gonna be thinking, well, okay, my hedge made a little bit of money, but it didn't really cover what I thought it was gonna cover. That's what'll end up happening. Could you tell us more about your process of creating a new strategy, finding the right correlations? Yeah, I can. What I'm actually planning on doing and I guess I should just tease it right now. This is the first time I've mentioned it, but I am planning for the VTS community. So sorry, live stream people that are watching for free. You can still tune into my live streams, but for the VTS community, I am planning on doing some type of six week or eight week training program where we're actually going to build a community strategy together. So with the express goal of building something that is significantly better than the S&P 500 performance wise. And you could see, uh oh, I've got some type of spammer here. Let me deal with this. I've been told that there is a way, come on, dude, what are you doing? That's awful. YouTube's gonna hate me now. Um, anyway, I, I don't know how to deal with this stupid stuff. I, I thought there was a way that I could actually click their name and block them, but um, apparently I can't. So anyway, just ignore that <laughs> bright, distracting stuff in the chat there. But uh, the point of building the community strategy would be showing you the steps that we take. I've already built the strategy, you know, a number of years ago. It's, it's something sort of on the bench that's pretty ideal, I think, to bring back into the main portfolio. And so I thought we could just open it up and unpack it. But essentially what it would be, if you're looking to do it yourself, everything starts with an idea. So you have an idea, you have a hypothesis about the market. I think that, or boy, I've noticed that that's a little bit weird. There seems to be a pattern there. It all starts with that. You have to ask yourself a question. What am I seeing? And is there a way to capitalize on this? And then the next step would be to start testing and just test like crazy. So you could do it like I do. I'm a little bit old school. I really like Excel testing, back testing, get your data, start running numbers, start, you know, make a list. I'm going to test this today and then check it off the box. And what you'll find is when you run through that test, whatever it was for the daily, you know, your goal for the day, you're going to get two more ideas that spin off of that. You know, maybe you proved yourself wrong in this case, but you thought, oh, I wonder if I just tweak it a little bit here and there. And eventually, after several months of doing that and probably, you know, thousands of cups of coffee, you're going to end up with something that you think looks pretty good on a spreadsheet in a backtest. But of course, 99% of backtests will fail when they go live trading. So over optimization, curve fitting, that's all a problem. But eventually, you're going to end up with something that looks good. And then you're just going to have to throw some capital at it and trade it. So my typical rule, I've been doing this back since 2010. 
basically when I, 2011, I took a pretty big portfolio loss. I actually made a full video talking about it. Um, I showed my brokerage account and everything. Took a, I lost like $71,000 in a single month. And um, what I did from that point on was I subdivided my account into like 15 different sections. And I would dedicate $25,000 to any new ideas that I have. And I would just trade it for a couple of years. Hopefully you get a few different market environments. And if it survives, then you know you've got a good strategy. If it fails, you know it's just one of millions of back tests that looked good on paper and didn't pan out. But that's sort of the general process that I go through. But stay tuned. I know the name. I know who you are. And um, we're going to go do a community one. So if anybody wants to sign up for the VTS community, of course, now would be a decent time to do that. I don't like my live streams to be advertisements, though. So forget I just said that. <clears throat> okay. Since you said questions may not be related to the main topic, I have another question. You seem to be reading a lot of my articles. That's good. Based on Article 627, do you think buying straddles would be a good strategy for low vol? Well, I don't know what Article 627 is, but I can go ahead and check that. Article 627. Oh, it's not uploaded yet. This is my new website. I haven't launched it yet. I thought it was uploaded. Let's go to the old website. Blog articles. Sorry, bear with me. Articles, everybody can follow these. What did you say, 627? 627, best asset class for low volatility. That doesn't sound like a question about straddles. 627, do you think buying straddles would be a good, oh, okay. Good strategy for low vol. So what was I writing about way back then? I was talking about the best asset class for when the volatility barometer is probably below 60%. Low volatility, oh, zero to 20. So the best, yeah, the, the basic sum I, I believe was gold and real estate are pretty decent. Uh, utilities were probably pretty decent. And then there was a bunch of things that would have lost money, like surprisingly, people think the SPY would be good, but it's actually not. TLT, negative. SPY, negative. So would straddles be good? Uh, yes. I would prefer broken wing butterflies, but I think what you're getting at, and I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're basically saying when volatility gets really low, the market would be essentially running on fumes at that point, and there's probably not a whole lot of upside left. So would it be a good idea to sell straddles at that point? Yes, because the chance of further upside, let me get a visual for you here. Start pointing to stuff. S&P 500, let's just assume, let's go back to a longer term chart so we can find something that's good. When volatility gets really low, like sort of in these ranges here, it's, it's very unlikely that it's going to make a really strong move upward. So at that point, you could start focusing on more delta neutral strategies, like a straddle, for example. You could start selling straddles. The reason I say I would prefer you to focus on broken wing butterflies is if you get something like this, okay, you sold a straddle here thinking that it's going to fizzle out and die, but it actually crashed. And that straddle is going to hurt you pretty badly as well. So what I would say is a more broken wing butterfly hedging against, you want to skew the results a little bit. So if this does happen to you, then it's not the end of the world. You might kick back a little bit of loss, but you're not going to get devastated. Like a short naked straddle, of course, has unlimited loss, and this would not be a lot of fun. So that's all I would warn you against is you definitely want to be aware that when the stock market is topping, you're on the right track to say that you want to focus less on trend following and more on delta neutral. But be careful, because sometimes fall apocalypse is the next week. So uh, make sure you do something that's uh, actually reasonably protected. <clears throat> Here's a question from Tom. Seasonal type things can be made to look great with curve fitting, but not profitable in real changing market situations regimes. That's a fantastic comment. It is exactly right that sometimes the data looks extremely promising to the point where you're looking at it, you're like, wow, that, that can't be right. Well, are you telling me all I have to do is just hold the S&P on the last four days of every month and I ignore the rest and I'm going to make all this money? Maybe, but 
Probably not. And again, there's going to opportunity cost of money is a real thing. Even if you could make a profit doing something, doesn't mean you couldn't make a better profit doing something else. Always default to the best profit maker, not just a profit, if you know what I mean. So yeah, there's always better ways to allocate capital than trying to guesswork on curve fitted seasonality. It's just not a good way for a quant style investor to focus their time or their capital. Can you talk a little bit about M7 to M4? We usually say the other way around. That's interesting. M4 to M7 backwardation as a signal. Related question, do you trade VIXM at all? I've been observing it and it's been performing quite well throughout all of this. Okay, let's address the first one. Can I talk a little bit about it? Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. I can blab about anything. You don't know me. You don't, you're, you're new to my live streams if you ask, can I talk about it? Give me a topic, I'll talk about it for an hour. So M1, M2, the, the reason this is a volatility signal is because contango happens 84% of the time and the volatility ETP specifically trade only based on these front two products. So nothing else matters except these two products and whatever the VIX index is trading at, the gap between this is called the roll yield. So we focus on those. But M4 to M7, this part of the curve over here if it moves slower, right? It takes more to give this middle part of the curve time to react. So if you could find volatility ETPs that trade based on this, and there are very few left, then you could probably smooth out your performance. You wouldn't get the big massive moves from the front two months, but the trade-off would be smoother performance, lower drawdowns, and as you probably know, that's actually a better way to make a profit than getting big gains and big losses. Smooth results will probably do better long term. So what you're getting at is the VIXM, which is a product that trades the M4 to the M7. There's VXZ. There used to be the ZIV, which was the inverse product, but it was terminated on the same day that TVIX was terminated. So essentially, uh, the reason M4 to M7 works really well in volatility trading, and I'll get to the second part because I do use it specifically, is because it moves slower. So the whole presentation that I made today was based on the fact that we're trying to avoid those massive gap days. One way that you can do that, instead of trying to divide day versus night, which doesn't work, you could actually try to push out your time frame to the middle part of the VIX futures, and it actually is better that way. Now, unfortunately, to get the short vol exposure in the M4 to M7 isn't as easy anymore because shorting the long products, the volume is significantly lower on those. And it's just, you know, shorting itself carries its own risks. There's fees involved. There's, you're not totally in control of your shares. They can be called away at any time. It's not ideal. So I actually haven't done the short vol trade for M4 to M7 since the IV was terminated. But on the long vol side, yes. So what can we do? I can just quickly pull up uh, one of our daily newsletters. Come on, internet. I hate when you need the internet to be fast. And that's the time that it drags. So let's see what I posted today. This is today's email. And I'm doing all this to basically show you the strategy that specifically uses VIXM. So this was today's email and the strategy in question is this one here. So you can see anytime volatility is in the elevated range over 80% on the volatility barometer. So for me personally, I have created my own volatility index called the volatility barometer. It's basically taking into account, you know, dozens of volatility metrics rather than just the silly VIX. The VIX is not a good measure at all. I've got this. So if it gets over 80%, then I'm going to go long volatility. And you might think, oh, well, great. He's going to go long UVXY or long VXX. Actually, I'm going to go long VIXM because it's more controllable and it moves slower. And when I'm long volatility, I'm not actually targeting big profit. What I'm most worried about is the vol crush on the other side killing my trade. If you're going to go long UVXY or long UVIX these days, which is the old TVIX, you can really get whipsawed pretty hard. So I actually like the M4 to M7 products. To answer your second part of your question, yes, when I'm going long volatility, I would much prefer to use the slower moving VIXM. So I think you're on the right track there. 
Okay. You'll repeat the question. I'm going to block that person as soon as I turn this live stream off. But uh, apologies, everybody. I'll repeat the question, but maybe at the wrong place. Are the historical prices in VIX Central at open or at close? So if you, if you do the historical tab, sorry, I must have missed this somewhere. I don't know where you asked it. But if you use the historical tab, it's going to be market on close prices. It's going to be the closing values for the VIX futures that day. So by the time you put this whole thing into your spreadsheet, hopefully that's what you guys are doing every single day. If you're not, um, when my VTS options relaunches, I'm going to include all the volatility data. Where is it here? What am I doing? Just random scrolling, making everybody sick. Um, I'm going to include the volatility data. But yes, to answer your question, it is uh, closing values. So now let's get into some of the submitted questions. Refresh this just to catch any last minute ones. I haven't looked at any of these. I like to just go live. I like to just be spontaneous. <clears throat> so top to bottom, I haven't organized any of, how many of them are there? Oh yeah, I can totally do this. So number one, do you believe in random walk theory that prices are randomly distributed? Also, do you use probability framework in your trading? So as to the first part, yeah, I mean, in general, yes, prices, I have no idea. None of us know what's happening in the future. As to what type of distribution stock market returns are, I mean, obviously they follow a bell distribution, right? They, they are random. There's going to be occurrences on both sides. It's going to be a bell distribution, but it's not a normal bell distribution. Of course, the, the tails are going to be a little bit fatter, right? If you use a normal distribution for stock market return, sometimes you'll have one of these events that it'll say, oh, it's a, you know, it's a 20 sigma event. This, this should happen once every whatever, you know, 10,000 years. And you get them every three years, right? That's because the tails are obviously a little bit fatter in, in the markets. It's not a normal distribution. But yeah, it's random and it's unknown and all of that stuff. I always say the markets are a random walk. That's why intraday trading, we just do what we do. Like when I was taking this trade, when I closed this UVXY trade, um, I have no idea whether closing it now is going to be better than closing it an hour from now. I just know that this trade needed to be closed today. So I closed it. That's it. I did, there's, it's the only calculus that there is. I have to buy, I had to sell the XLU utilities yesterday. I don't want to get in there and say, well, I could sell it at noon, but it, you know, maybe at three o'clock the prices will be better. I don't know. Nobody knows. Just if it needs to be done today, just do it. As far as the probability framework in my trading, I would say everything I do is, is probability framework. All of the options trading, all of the tactical investing that we do, all of the volatility metrics that I'm mining, I do all of this from a probability perspective, right? I mean, the, the volatility barometer is 75% right now. I can tell you, historically speaking, the probability of stocks doing well, I could tell you the exact performance of what the stock market has done and the probability that it's going to do well or poorly tomorrow. I could give you that number. It doesn't mean that it's not going to rocket higher. It just means the odds are low. So I would say, you know, in a roundabout way, literally everything I do is probability related. Hopefully I answered that question, what you were asking. Question is not related to day or overnight. I've been trying to find your reasons to trade UVXY over VIX options with your butterflies. Taking as an example UVXY July, the PL is almost the same, just a two times factor. Okay, I think I know where you're going with this. UVXY, we did the 15, 14, 12. Yeah, exactly. You answered your own question here. Um, why would I do UVXY instead of the VIX? Preference. But you have to understand that markets, in general, it's not specifically true, but in general, everything is priced efficiently. So you could do the same strategy on UVXY and you could transfer that over to the VIX if you wanted. I just happen to like the way that the UVXY trades with that strategy because it's based on direction. The UVXY, I'm shorting vol, and we know that the UVXY typically goes down and we know under what conditions it typically goes down. So I just like to use the UVXY better. But if you're talking about just a specific 
comparison of the math, yeah, the VIX works. You could do the same thing with the S&P 500, with treasuries, with gold. You could do it all. It's just that it's mostly beneficial for me to use the thing that I can predict when it's going down. It's the same thing why I use my VIX option strategy, for example. I do the VIX specifically. This is my current trade right now for the 20th of July cycle. I've got all those trades open, basically just throwing out a big net to try to capture as much price as I can, hedging the high side, of course. You know, you'd think, well, if it spikes to, spikes to 80, you're gonna get smoked. Well, I actually, I buy plenty of upside delta, so, you know, if the VIX spikes, worst case scenario, I might lose three, four grand, but that's if it spikes to 53 in a single day. I will buy plenty of high side delta and low side delta, you can see, but why do I do it on the, I could do this same thing on any ticker I wanted. It's just, I've been doing this since 2010 on the VIX every single month. I've been building these structures for myself and every single month. So sometimes I'll have two or three of these going at the same time. It's all based on preference and you finding your edge. So you're not wrong to say that the VIX offers the same opportunity. Basically it does because options are an effective market. They price efficiently. I just like shorting vol with UVXY and I like delta neutral with VIX options and I like directional exposure with equity indexes. This is my style. So hopefully that answers your question. For me personally, I go where I'm best and I can make the most money. I apply my edge to where I think it most, most applies and makes the most money. I asked this last week. The question was about SVXY. Luca, oh, same person. Your question is literally today's live stream. So if you were wondering, it was directly because of you. Yes. Everybody got that 20 minute presentation because of you, Lucas. So thank you for that. I have three questions. Okay. Do we have time for this? The, calcul the calculation of the IV percentile of the metrics is based on all the previous values. Are you using rolling 357? Okay, so what he's asking is, in my daily metrics, I always show the percentile rank, but he's asking, is this a lifetime percentile rank or is this a rolling window percentile rank? These are all lifetime. So when you see these, it's going back to the inception of that metric. So M1, M2, VIX futures, percentile rank right now, 21. It means that 21% of the time going back to March 26, 2004, a 1.12 is higher than 21% of all values and lower than 79% of all values. Hopefully that answered it. In your VIX minus volley article, you said that the metric is above two, means that hedging activity and fear in the air. It seems that most of the time past, sorry, I'm trying to do this quickly because three questions. I don't want to keep everybody too long today. Sounds like another Ferrari went by. Need to change the values for the current environment. Okay, so VIX minus volley residual metric. When I, in my article, I guess I mentioned that if it's over two, it's representing, you know, higher percentile rankings. And that means that out of the money activity is more. So the VIX index, for anybody who doesn't know, it is measured based on S&P 500 options activity, but it's using an entire strip of the options. So it's using in the money, out of the money, at the money, an entire strip. Whereas the volley, is an at the money options based on the SPY ETF. So if you just deduct VIX minus volley, you get the residual, which is out of the money options activity on the S&P 500. So if that number is high, of course it means that there's more hedging behavior happening. That doesn't necessarily mean it's direction. A whole lot of out of the money volatility, like that metric is very high, this is what a straddle looks like, a short straddle, right? A short strangle is over here. You're selling far out of the money. Short straddle sells two in the middle. So if you have a high VIX to volley residual, meaning out of the money options are being overpriced right now, sell the straddle or sell the strangle because you're selling over here where most of the volatility is. The straddle is at the money, which is not actually that juiced up at the moment. Same thing with an iron condor versus an iron butterfly. An iron condor is selling the far out of the wings. If you've got a VIX minus volley residual that's very low, it means out of the money volatility is being underpriced. 
And so you'd want to go closer to the money. You'd want to choose the iron butterfly instead of the iron condor. They're basically, the risk profile is very similar between the two. But of course, you want to sell things that are expensive and buy things that are cheap. And anytime you can get a little bit of an edge, I'm not, I don't post these saying like, this is the end all be all of trading. But having that edge for trade selection might mean the difference between you making a 10 percent rate of return long term versus 15 and compounded over a 30 year career that could make a very very big difference you're talking about hundreds of thousands maybe over a million dollar difference in that five percent distribution so i'm always looking for little edges here and there um as to what you're saying recently it's sort of persistently high all the time and should i adjust for that i don't see anything wrong with looking at rolling three, five, seven windows if you were using it as a trend following signal. But like I said, I'm using it mostly to price options. So I just want to know what the absolute number is. I just want to know right now today, is there a lot of out of the money premium being overpriced or is it being underpriced? That's all I'm really looking for. So no, but kind of yes to the first one. You could definitely do rolling windows for different purpose. And then lastly, last week you opened a broken wing butterfly below the current value when the VXX crush level was positive, if your metrics indicate that UVXY is going to rise, why open the butterfly? So again, going to our metrics, I like to post the one day, five day, 21 day forward prediction of where the volatility ETPs will be every day for the community. So if you're trading UVXY and it's at 1480, 21 days from now, based on current volatility metrics, you know, adjusted M1, M2 and all the roll yield, probably UVXY won't move very much. So your question is, why did I open the trade? Well, essentially, because broken wing butterflies are no risk to the upside. So why not open the trade? If we do one here, 13 strike, broken wing butterfly, I'll do the 14, 13, 11 for two weeks from now. There's very little risk to not opening it. So the current price is right here. And in order to get in trouble, it has to go all the way to 11. In order to make a profit, it only has to go to 13, which could happen in, you know, two days of volatility decay could happen. So why not open it now? I mean, I'm not expecting the UVXY to slam lower, but then again, the trade structure itself allows me to take on risk. Why not? I lose $21 if I'm wrong, I could maybe make, you know, three, three times that much. So that's why that I did it. The other, the other reasons I did it is because we do actually have a little bit of net long market exposure. We were at the time long real estate and we were long utilities. So there is actually a reason to open a trade, even though I'm not specifically predicting the vol crush as, as in mathematically, I can open those trades anytime I want. That's one of the reasons I like that strategy so much. Um, total freedom to go ahead and roll the dice. And if it does crash down the other way and it just blows way past, which doesn't happen often, but it does, then the rest of the portfolio will make, uh, will make some money to cover that. So that is why. Thanks for the questions. What about overnight on VIX futures? I know there's not options on CME micro contracts, but is there VIX futures options available? Yes, there's both of those available. Um, oh, you, uh, on options specifically. Well, there's, um, there's mini VIX futures, if that's what you're asking. They trade at a one-tenth notional. So instead of VX, you are looking for VXM. It's just, you know, the VIX futures minis. And I believe, I don't trade futures, but I believe, you know, you're talking about $100, uh, $100 ticks, basically. So is that your question? Yeah, you can just you can use the full futures or you can use the VIX mini futures. Now there are differences between futures and options, so maybe that's your question. There are no you know mini options if that's what you're getting at. Uh, but yeah, you can go ahead and trade the the mini futures. It's a great product. I don't happen to trade futures very much at all, but there's certainly no reason not to. They're just fine for any application. You can everything you can do with options, you can do with the futures. So. Just be aware that there are slight things you want to pay attention to. There are little differences here and there. Is VXX a suitable replacement for adjusted M1, M2 
futures, if not why? I got to say, I don't understand this question. So next week, you're going to have to kind of elaborate and answer it again, because these two are not, I mean, they're related, of course. VXX trades entirely based on the M1, M2 VIX futures that it holds. But as a replacement, I mean, this is a derivative of this. So I don't see why we would be talking about one replacing the other. They are basically the same thing. The VXX trades entirely based on the pricing of M1, M2. Sorry, doing these lives sometimes, I might have just missed an obvious question here, but I, I got to say, I don't know what you're getting at. So maybe next week we'll try again. Website... Vic Central website. Oh, you've already asked that. Yes, same person. So that's where I missed it. Sorry, I think next week maybe I'll prioritize the submitted questions instead of the other ones. But yeah, so great questions there. I hate looking at that stupid person spamming my chat. That's ugly. There's only two more here. And then we'll call it a night. That was a good session. So for those of us who weren't part of the VTS options, can you give us a primer on what to expect? Will it be systematic like VTS or is it some discretionary trading of options? How active will it be? Well, I mean, quite frankly, I am, I'm going to go all in on this. I'm going to make it I haven't solidified anything. So, I mean, it's tough to even talk about it on a live stream because people can just post it and say, you said this two months ago, but where my brain is right now, I'm not never a person who keeps secrets or anything. So I'll give you my answer as of July 1st, 2022, but you know, subject to change. It's going to be a lifetime membership. So it's gonna be in some form of a course where people purchase the course and they'll be a member for life. I'll probably start with three or four of my favorite strategies. And it's not going to be like signal service. It's going to be me teaching you the exact strategies. I'll give you the exact spreadsheets that you need to trade them. I'll explain exactly how to do it. We'll do live streams every week and we'll just do the live trades until you know and you can take the reins yourself. It's basically for the purpose of teaching you how to trade options eventually on your own in your own account without having to pay somebody for signals. So start with three or four strategies, unpack them over several weeks and several months, and then it's a lifetime membership every three months or something, I don't know, every whenever we say, we're just gonna add another strategy. And I have plenty, I have 12, 13, 15 strategies that are, um, effective in certain markets. So there's going to be no shortage of new stuff added over time. Like I said, there's going to be a master data spreadsheet. People will get their VIX future stuff. I'll give you a volatility strategy, like an ETF strategy to, uh, to have for yourself. Uh, that's what I'm envisioning more than just, you know, the, I, I'm, I don't know how much experience you have with option services out there, but there is a, an enormous amount of fraud going on where basically there's a million ways to make a legitimately real track record trading options to make it look 10 times better than it actually is. So what ends up happening is these people will launch a service and they'll use five or six of the most common tactics to make your real track record look insanely good. And you can do that as long as you have knowledge of those little tricks. They're not difficult to figure out and you can make it look very good, but then subscribers jump on and they don't get anywhere close to the performance that is being posted on the websites. And they're talking about all these big wins and the subscribers are like, I'm down money. What are you talking about? So it's going to, it's not going to be anything to do with that. I'm going to be actually teaching, calling it roughly again, not written in stone, but the VTS options Academy, there'll be live streams every week. And I think it will be quite awesome. So I'm going to pour my 17 years of experience into the very best option service that I can. And I'm going to hopefully make it so you buy that and you're, you're good. You're part of the community and you won't, have to, uh, you won't have to be tricked and fooled and disappointed with all those other millions of services out there. If you know me, I, I think you know what I'm getting at. Um, I'm quite against the 
even though I manage a subscription service, I am no fan of the general ethics that are going on in this industry. I'll fix all that up and give people what they, what they want. Thoughts on active vol ETFs like CYA and S vol. I haven't actually looked in a while, so just out of pure curiosity, I, I don't like S vol, but um, let's see this performance. I mean, you've got you know MSVX. You've got a, a lot of these dynamic strategies that are sort of meant to. A lot of them basically they're trying to take the S and P five hundred and improve on it by applying a dynamic hedge, some type of VIX hedge or VIX futures hedge. And uh, they typically don't work because they're too rigid and they are fund managed. So they typically fall way short of the marketing material. I can go ahead and do videos on them. I've done a video on MSVX. I mean, it, it was seemingly good. I don't think it's, I don't think it's gone anywhere since it launched. You can just check that out. So MSVX is kind of one of those things where it is, uh, it's basically the marketing material will tell you that it is designed specifically to take the S&P 500 and then just hedge out the risk and obviously dramatically outperform the SPY long term is kind of what they say. I don't think so. So it's basically flat, which isn't really the mandate that they... I mean, they basically are saying that it's supposed to track the S&P in good times and then hedge out in bad times, but it didn't do either of those things. So this is what typically happens with managed dynamic funds is that they're too rigid. They're managed with a lot of rules. They are subject to all the pitfalls of the financial industry. As I've always said, we know that the active asset manager performance out there is utter garbage, you know, 90% of the time. But it's not because the fund managers themselves are stupid or anything. Like we could laugh at them and say, oh, they, those Wall Street people, they have no idea what they're doing. They do. It's just that the, the system that they're under, they've got compliance officers breathing down their throat. They've got mandates they can't deviate from. They've got, you know, marketing is a part of it and doing things for short-term performance is part of it. And there's a whole lot of reasons why Wall Street sucks so bad, right? It's not because they're stupid people. They're actually extremely smart and successful and educated and all those things. It's just those funds don't work. They just, they're garbage. So, um, yeah. It, when I see one that's worth doing, I would certainly report on it accurately. I have no skin in the game here. I just, I've never seen any of them that deliver on any of the promises that they say they will. It's all, it sounds fantastic in a marketing brochure, but it's the same thing as all these long volatility people on Twitter. They sound like the smartest people in the room all the time, but have you seen their performance? I mean, it's, it's a disaster. They, they don't have to show it, so of course they can just tweet and they can get you know tens of thousands of followers and they sound like, oh, they're talking about Vama and Gamma and all this stuff. They sound brilliant. Yeah, until you have to make money for an actual third party person and then they don't have no idea how to do that. But again, it's not because they're not smart, it's just because they're operating under a system they can't possibly compete with somebody who doesn't have those limitations. So uh, that's my thoughts. And when I find one that's worth looking at, I'd look at it, but I've never seen any that I would even throw $1 into, including all those tail risk funds that people seemingly think that are so brilliant, I wouldn't put a single dollar into any of those things. They're all trash. Why prefer butterflies over iron condors or both work as well? Similar risk profile. I mean, the risk reward, the, all the Greeks line up very similar. It's just that butterflies is largely selling more at the money premium and iron condors are more out of the money premium. So you would want to sell the premium that is the overpriced and buy the premium that's the underpriced, right? It's the same reason why, you know, when you're setting up a trade, it, it's always a, you know, a decent idea. Like, let's say you were you were setting up a trade on SPY, for example. Come on, internet. What is going on? Are you guys still with me? Seems like I'm still live. No data. Oh, there we go. 
That took way too long. So let's say you were setting up a trade on uh, the SPY, for example. You know, there's nothing wrong with looking into the product depth when you're trying to choose between a iron condor or a butterfly. Like you could, I don't know what strikes you'd be looking for, but let's say on the call side, you, you narrow it down to some little window. Sometimes you'll notice that there's a little bit of a kink, right? So, I mean, these are not significant enough to sell, but sometimes you'd look into the depth and you'd think, wow, they're you know, the 340 is a little bit overpriced. Like right there, there's a little bit of a kink. Sometimes they're much more pronounced. And nothing wrong with selling that one and buying the one that's low, right? These types of things actually do show up. Let's see if we can get a different one. All series, let's do August. And we're doing the put side this time. Yeah, nothing really there. Sometimes you'll see something though. That, my point is that these are little edges, little edges. It's like reducing trade fees. It's not that much, but it's a little bit of an edge. The difference between an iron condor and an iron butterfly is just small edge. Just if you're selling the juicy premium and buying the less expensive premium, probably you're gonna be better off. You can give yourself a little, you know, two to 3% advantage there, and which really adds up over time. So there's a list of many, many things that you can do to take a trade that might just be average and turn it into really good. And this is one of them that just knowing when to choose which one of those is, is a skill in itself. And it, if that, if knowing when to choose a condor versus a butterfly, knowing when to choose a, you know, strangle versus a straddle, knowing when to put a broken wing butterfly rather than a standard butterfly, these little things, if that could make one to 2% difference in your portfolio, that might add up to half a million dollars by the time you're 65 years old. So yeah, don't ignore little edges like that. They are extremely important. Why are you not trading VIX futures? I just typically don't. I, I get everything that I need done with the VIX options and equity markets, bonds, treasuries, gold, all that stuff. I Technically, I do trade VIX futures because I trade volatility ETPs all the time. I have many strategies that use UVXY, VXX, as I mentioned before, ZIV, VIXM, all of these things. So I am trading the futures. I just find it more efficient to have them packaged, bundle it for me, right? I could simulate that. I have the knowledge to simulate my volatility ETF or basically apply any strategy, calendars, diagonals, whatever you want. I just prefer to do the VIX options or regular options, but nothing wrong with futures. Just additional permissions, you know, the fact that I manage, you know, send out trades to a thousand people, it, everybody has to get specific permissions for futures. There's reasons, but uh, yeah, there's efficiencies as well. Futures as far as sometimes tax advantage, sometimes other ways that they're efficient. They can also be inefficient large amounts of capital requirement in many cases. You'd have to focus on the minis, but yeah. I think I got, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, I didn't say much, honestly. Give me two, three months to, to put it all together. I think it's, I think people are gonna be very impressed, but you know me, you know I'm a perfectionist, you know I have a lot of detail and I would never put out anything that, that isn't going to be like, wow, this is, this is great. I'm not going to put out some silly product. It's not a money grab, essentially. Um, as you probably know, if you're a member of the community, which you are, um, me closing down VTS options last year because I got too busy, again, I, I hate talking about money, but there were you know, hundreds of people on that service, um, well over 500 people on the service. Me closing that down cost a lot of money, to be honest. But I don't do things for money. I do things for long-term satisfaction and building things that make me proud. So yeah, it, this is, it's not gonna be a money grab. It's, it's gonna be good. And I won't release it until it's actually good. So would you ever consider trading fixed income volatility? How could I start doing this? Um, not sure why, no. Um, preference, style, edge. I mean, for me, I, I divide my portfolio essentially. Can I show you something? 
No, I don't have that open. Essentially, I divide my portfolio 60-40, standard 60-40, but not 60-40 stocks, bonds. 60% trend following-ish strategies that typically use ETFs and tactical rotation, and then 40% option trading, which allows me to do delta neutral strategies or long volatility strategies, earnings trades, and that's how I balance my portfolio. So anything that is outside of that, I would never say don't do it or don't focus on it or there's no edge there. There might be. It's just I can't do everything, right? You have to figure out what works best for you. And I've been doing this for 17 years. I have found a lot of strategies that work very well for me. And then sometimes I'll research other things and deviate a little bit. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. VXX still broken. So this will be the last question. It is still technically broken. So remember when you're looking at the VXX, the time that you'll know that it's not broken anymore, if you type in VXX minus VXX.IV, my internet's crazy slow. So I hope you guys are even still here. I might be talking to myself today. But the time that you'll know that it's actually fixed is when this gap is completely closed. Now, you can obviously see that people have totally lost interest with this thing. Um, it was, Barclays handled it terribly, but the gap between the NAV price and the indicative value, the intraday indicative value, it is still 56 cents, which isn't nothing, right? That's on something that's trading at $22, you know, uh, VXX.IV. 56 cents on $22, it's not nothing, but it's not totally broken. Like it looked for a while there like it was gonna be crazy. It was a $6 premium, but no, it just fizzled out. Because honestly, somebody actually asked this on, um, asked this today. I actually prepared it for next week, but who cares? We're going for it now. I hope you can see this. Um, Somebody asked this, I had a little conversation. So why not take advantage of the 70 cent difference by shorting VXX with long in the right proportion of VIXY? Of course, VXX and VIXY are materially identical. They're just, one's an ETF, one's an ETN, but they basically trade the same futures. So it's an arbitrage opportunity. I, my answer was, let me see, I can't remember. I talked about that in the live stream. Technically speaking, there may be arbitrage, actually capitalizing on it is very difficult and in my opinion not worth the risk remember price gap can go both ways and time is always unknown so what i'm getting at is essentially while there is technically still a gap here it is broken and there might be 60 or 70 cents to capitalize on there's really nothing there and that's why everybody has given up on this because let me go continue further the person said that's why I hold the arbitrage in the shares and not the options, since time is unknown, but it seems that Credit Suisse organizing themselves to renew support so that you're guessing that it's gonna come back online and be fixed soon. The last tweet, and essentially my point in all of this was, come on, make sure you can all see this. It's not risk-free, so it can go both ways. It could go right back up and the people could gain interest again and something could happen and it could go the other way. But mainly it's the same thing we were talking about with the day and night earlier. Opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is a very real thing in investing. So if you're talking about trying to figure out a way to capitalize on this 60 cents, it's been four months already and we don't know how long it's gonna maintain this. So you're telling me that you're going to try to set up some type of mathematical arbitrage between two things, one of which you're gonna to have to short and pay fees on, and you're subject to those shares getting called away from you. So you're gonna to try to set up this arbitrage opportunity to get 60 cents on something that's trading at 22.50. A 60 cent move in VXX can happen in one day with a normal volatility strategy, or two days or three days. You're gonna tie up all of that capital to make 60 cents, maybe. But if it goes the other way, you could actually lose money. Again, I'm not saying you couldn't make money doing that. The VXX is still technically broken. But why would you tie up so much capital when you could just apply that capital to something else and you wouldn't have to wait four months to get your 60 cents? I just made 
the equivalent of 60 cents in a weekly trade on the UVXY. I allocated very little capital and made a very nice profit. There are better ways to allocate capital. So one of the things I, I often feel like traders get, get boxed in with is focusing on things that make profit. It's natural, right? You find something that can make money. If it's a positive return, you think it's working. If it's a negative return, it's not working. That is not true. Everything is relative. And just because something made money, 60 cents, let's say you did it all right and you bought this one and you shorted this one in the perfect amount and everything worked out and you get your 60 cents as soon as Barclays resumes share creation. Awesome. But all of the other traders out there that have an edge in a certain strategy have made 10 times what you made in that time that you were waiting. Plus you took on risk. So opportunity cost, I wouldn't do it personally for me. But uh, all right, I think that's all the questions. I, we nailed a whole bunch today. That must have been 30 questions there. Why is VXM, VIXM so elevated since 2020? I don't really know. I mean, that's kind of been a mystery. I did a video about two years ago talking about how um, the, the only other time, typically the M4 to M7 contango is basically in line with M1, M2. The only other time in history that the M4 to M7 has dropped this far below M1 and M2 was in 2007. And, and, and the first half of 2008, basically right before the great, the GFC. It's the only ever time it's ever happened. All the other times it's been very consistent. So read what you may, or is that meaning that since 2020, it's also been extremely depressed compared to the front two month futures. Is that saying that, you know, right now we're in the same situation as 2007? Because if you think about it, I, people often forget this, but it's worth reminding sometimes is that the S&P 500 actually was down 18% before the financial crisis happened. So from early 2007 up until Lehman Brothers actually fell off a cliff, you can see here, this is July 2007 Lehman Brothers collapsed here. The S&P 500 for a whole year basically was down 18% and really quite ugly, kind of similar trading to what we're seeing now, just persistently down and low, couple of bull market rallies, but basically down a lot, and then the bottom fell out. But this whole time here, the M4 to M7 futures were super low compared to historical levels, whereas M1, M2 were actually quite normal. So again, I'm not saying that history has to repeat itself, but if you want to be a conspiracy theorist, maybe, maybe 2022 is 2007 part two, and something's going to happen later this year that, you know, a new layman something or other, and uh, the bottom falls out again. So I don't know. Bottom line is it's, uh, it's super low compared to M1, M2. Odd. There's something there. Everybody's pricing in, you know, everybody's willing to take on risk short term, but nobody wants to trade those futures four months out because there's so much doubt and uncertainty and, you know, what's the Fed going to do? So I suspect that's it. Just I'll take I'll take uncertainty over the next two weeks, but I won't take uncertainty over the next four months. I think that's what's happening there. All right. Cool. So good one today. Great question.